Chapter 1 of Poison Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Goodson. Poison Island by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Chapter 1. How I first met with Captain Coffin. It was in the dusk of a July evening of the year 1813 july the twenty seventh to be precise that on my way back from the mail coach office falmouth to mr stimcoe's academy for the sons of gentlemen number no. seven delamer terrace i first met captain coffin as he came drunk and cursing up the market strand with a rabble of children at his heels i have reason to remember the date and hour of this encounter not only for its remarkable consequences but because it befell on the very day and within an hour or two of my matriculation at Stimcoe's. That afternoon I had arrived at Falmouth by Royal Mail in charge of Miss Plindleman, my father's housekeeper. And now but ten minutes ago I had seen out that excellent lady and waved farewell to her, not without a sinking of the heart, on her return journey to Minden Cottage, which was my home my name is harry brooks and my age on this remembered evening was fourteen and something over my father major james brooks late of the fourth king's own regiment had married twice and at the time of his retirement from active service was for the second time a widower blindness contracted by exposure and long marches over the snows of galicia had put an end to a career by no means undistinguished in his last fight at coruna he had not only earned a mention in dispatches from his brigadier-general lord william bentinck but by his alertness in handling his half regiment at a critical moment and refusing its right to an outflanking line of french had been privileged to win almost the last word of praise uttered by his idolized commander my father heard and faced about but his eyes were already failing him they missed the friendly smile with which sir john moore turned and cantered off along the brigade to encourage the fiftieth and forty-second regiments and to receive a few minutes later the fatal cannon shot everyone has heard what miseries the returning transports endured in the bitter gale of january eighteen o nine the londonderry in which my father sailed did indeed escape wreck but at the cost of a week's beating about the mouth of the channel he was by rights an invalid having taken a wound in the kneecap from a spent bullet one of the last fired in the battle but in the common peril he bore a hand with the best for three days and two nights he never shifted his clothing which the gale alternately soaked and froze it was frozen stiff as a board when the londonderry made the entrance of plymouth town and he was borne ashore in a rheumatic fever from this and from his wound the doctors restored him at length but meanwhile his eyesight had perished his misfortunes did not end here my stepsister isabel a beautiful girl of seventeen the only child of his first marriage had met him at plymouth nursed him to convalescence and brought him home to minden cottage to the garden which henceforward he tilled but so only through memory since then she had married a young officer in the fifty second regiment a lieutenant archibald plindleman but her husband having to depart at once for the peninsula she had remained with her father and tended him as before until death took her as it had taken her mother in childbirth the babe did not survive her and to complete the sad story her husband fell a few weeks later before badajos while assaulting the bicurina gate with fifty x-men of the light division beneath these blows of fate my father did indeed bow his head yet bravely from the day isabel died his shoulders took a sensible stoop but this was the sole evidence of the mortal wound he carried unless you count that from the same day he put aside his any eat and told me no more from it but spent his hours for the most part in meditation often with a bible open on his knee although his eyes could not read it sally 
Our cook told me one day that when the foolish midwife came and laid the child in his arms, not telling him that it was dead, he felt it over and broke forth in a terrible cry, his first and last protest. In me, the only child of his second marriage, as Isabel had been the only child of his first, he appeared to have lost, and of a sudden, all interest. While Isabel lived there had been reason for this, or excuse at least, for he had loved her mother passionately, whereas from mine he had separated within a day or two after marriage, having married her only because he was obliged, or conceived himself obliged, by honor. Into this story I shall not go. It was a sad one, and, strange to say, sadly creditable to both. I do not remember my mother. She died, having taken some pains to hide even my existence from her husband, who nevertheless conscientiously took up the burden. A man more strongly conscientious never lived, and his sudden neglect of me had nothing to do with caprice, but came, as I am now assured, of some lesion of memory under the shock of my sister's death. As an unregenerate youngster I thought little of it at the time, beyond rejoicing to be free of my daily lesson in Virgil. I can see my father now, seated within the summer-house by the filbert tree at the end of the orchard, his favorite haunt, or standing in the doorway and drawing himself painfully erect, a giant of a man, to inhale the scent of his flowers, or listen to his bees, or the voice of the stream which bounded our small domain. I see him framed there, he sat almost touching the lintel, his hands gripping the posts like a blind Samson's, all too strong for the flimsy trellis work. He wore a brown holland suit, in summer, in colder weather, a fustian one of like color, and at first glance you might mistake him for a Quaker. His snow-white hair was gathered close beside the temples, back from a face of ineffable simplicity and goodness, the face of a man at peace with God and all the world, yet marked with scars, scars of bygone passions, cross-hatched and almost effaced by deeper scars of calamity, as Miss Plyman wrote in her album, Few men so deep as Major Brooks have drained affliction's cup, Alas, if one may trust his looks, I fear he's breaking up. This, Miss Plinleman, a maiden aunt of the young officer who had been slain at Badajoz, kept house for us after my sister's death. She was a lady of good Welsh family, who after many years of genteel poverty had come into a legacy of seven thousand pounds from an East Indian uncle, and my father, a simple liver content with his half pay, had much ado in his blindness to keep watch and war upon the luxuries she untimely strove to smuggle upon him. For the rest, Miss Plinleman wore corkscrew curls, talked sentimentally, worshipped the manly form, in the abstract, with the manly virtues, and possessed, quite unknown to herself, the heart of a lion. Upon this unsuspected courage, and upon the strength of her affection for me she had drawn on the day when she stood up to my father, of whom, by the way, she was desperately afraid, and told him that his neglect of me was a sin and a shame and a scandal. And a good education, she wound up feebly, would render Harry so much more of a companion to you. My father rubbed his head vaguely. Yes, yes, you are right. I have been neglecting the boy, but pray end as honestly as you began, and do not pretend to be consulting my future when you are really pleading for this. To begin with, I don't want a companion. Next, I should not immediately make a companion of Harry by sending him away to school, and lastly, you know as well as I, that long before he finished his schooling, I should be in my grave. Well then, consider what a classical education would do for Harry, I feel sure that had I, pardon the supposition, been born a man and made conversion with the best thoughts of the ancients, Socrates, for example, what about him, my father demanded, so wise as I have always been given to understand, yet in his own age misunderstood, by his wife especially, and to crown all, unless I err, 
drowned in a bud of hemlock dear madam pardon me but how many of these accidents to socrates are you ascribing to his classical education but it comes out in so many ways miss plinliman persisted and it does make such a difference there's a je ne sais quoi you can tell it even in the way they handle a knife and fork that evening after supper miss plinliman declined her customary game of cards with me on the pretence that she felt tired and sat for a long while fumbling with a newspaper which i recognized for a weak old copy of the falmouth packet at length she rose abruptly and crossing over to the table where i sat playing dominoes right hand against left thrust the paper before me and pointed with a trembling finger there harry what would you say to that i brushed my dominoes aside and read the reverend philip stimco b a of copenhagen academy seven delamere terrace begs to inform the nobility clergy and chantry of falmouth and the neighbourhood that he has vacancies for a limited number of pupils of good social standing education classical on the lines of the best public schools combined with home comforts under the personal supervision of mrs stimco niece of the late honoured sir alexander o'brien or n admiral of the white and k c b backward and delicate boys are specialty separate bets commodious playground in a climate unrivalled for pulmonary ailments greenwich time kept i did not criticize the advertisement it sufficed me to read my release in it and in the same instant i knew how lonely the last few months had been and felt myself an ingrate i that had longed unspeakably if but half consciously for the world beyond minden cottage a world in which i could play the man welcomed my liberty by laying my head on my arms and breaking into unmanly sobs i will pass over the blissful week of preparation including a journey by van to torpoint and by ferry across to plymouth where miss plinniman bought me boots shirts collars undergarments a valise a low crowned beaver hat for sunday wear and for weekdays a cap shaped like a concertina where i was measured for two suits after a pattern marked boys clarence gentlemanly and where i expended two and sixpence of my pocket money on a piratical jackknife and a book of patriotic songs two articles indispensable it seemed to me to full-blooded manhood and i will come to the day when the royal mail pulled up before Menon cottage with a merry clash of bits and swingle bars and the scarlet coated guard having received my box from sally the cook and hoisted it aboard in a jiffy miss plinniman and i climbed up to a seat behind the coachman my father stood at the door and shook hands with me at parting good luck lad said he and remember our motto nil nisi recte good luck have thou with thine honour and by the way here's half a sovereign for you from the coachman shortening up his enormous sponge of reins Ta-ra-ra! from the guard's horn close behind my ear and we were off oh believe me there never was such a ride as we swept by the second milestone i stole a look at miss plinderman she sat in an ecstasy with closed eyes she was as she put it indulging in mental composition verses composed while riding by the royal mail i've sailed at eve over plymouth town for me it was a rare excursion oblivious of the risk of being drowned or even a more temporary immersion i dreamt myself the lady of the lake or an oriental one within limits on the bosphorus we left a trial of glory in our wake which the intelligent boatman ascribed to phosphorus yet agreeable as i found it over the ocean to glide within my bounding shallop i incline to think that for the poetry of motion one may even more confidently recommend the tantify galop end of chapter one recording by daniel goodson myfluentpodcast.com